Okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, welcome, good morning, um, happy Thursday morning, March 4th, and welcome to Regenerative Agriculture, A New Vision. Looks like we have something coming in the chat. Let's check that out. Excellent. Um, yes, for those of you who are here, if you have colleagues who are having a little bit of trouble getting in, we sent out it, an additional link this morning, which, which should be correct. Um, it should be the link that you used to get in. So please, if you do hear from one of your colleagues who was having some, some trouble getting in, um, or somebody who you knew was attending this, this webinar this morning, please do go ahead and let them know that that, that link that we sent out this morning should, should work. Um, it should be the one that you used to get in here. So we do apologize for any confusion about that. Um, looking forward to an absolutely wonderful session today. Um, I am Brandon Hayes with Bold Bison Communications and Consulting. I'm thrilled to be the moderator I'm helping to host with you this morning. Um, and this morning we have a great set of panelists coming up. So first we'll hear from David Brandt with Cover Crops to Build Carbon and Lower Input Cost. Um, he'll be followed by Kevin Kelly, Better for You, Better for Them, Better for the Earth. Love that title. Um, and, then, and then we'll close out the morning with Dr. Emily Heaton um, with Return on Investment from Precision Conservation. Um, and the way that it's going to work today is that each of the panelists will, will have an intro remark from Jim Singer. Um, each of the panelists will, will share their presentation and you'll be able to ask your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there is a Q&A feature and that's where you can enter your questions while each of the panelists is speaking. Um, and then at the end of their time, uh, at the end of each conversation, we'll have time for that Q&A. So we'll have some time for Q&A after David Brandt, after Kevin Kelly, and then again after Dr. Emily Heaton. But please do feel free while they are speaking to enter in that Q&A your, your questions that you may have for them. Um, and please also, if you have technical issues um, or any other questions from a technical standpoint this morning, please do use the, ch the chat um, to reach out to us and let us know. Um, we have Laura Riley here from Chicago Wilderness who's helping run, run things on that technical side. So please do let us know if you're having any issues and we'll be able to get those cleared up or help other people who may be having tr um, some trouble getting in. Today's session is presented by the Northeastern Illinois Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Chicago Wilderness and Illinois Extension. And it is sponsored, we are very grateful to our sponsors, the Natural Land Institute and the Illinois Division of the Isaac Walton League. So again, we're going to use the Q&A feature of Zoom to, to ask questions while the panelists are doing their presentations. Then we'll have moderated Q&A by yours truly after each speaker. And then if you do have any issues, any, any technical questions, please do reach out on the chat to us. Um, and Laura Riley will be able to, from Chicago Wilderness, will be able to help you with that. So now I would love to, to kick us off um, and ask Jim Singer from Land Use Council, um, he's a Land Use Council 16 chair, um, to make some opening remarks to help set the context for today's conversation. Thank you, Brandon. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you all with us this morning. Uh, I am the chair of the Land Use Council 16. Uh, just in case you didn't know, in Illinois, we've got 96 soil and water conservation districts and of those districts, they are divided into land use councils. 16 of them, we're at the top of the state pretty much, so we're number 16. Um, we have uh, regional partnerships with other soil and water conservation districts, both in our area and throughout the state. And we also work with the state association, different partners, um, so, uh, work with the Army Corps of Engineers and other local landowners and um, other entities and we try to educate and also train and help and provide services to them. So we're glad again to have you with us. Uh, that's some of what we do. As Brandon mentioned, we do have some uh, uh, very interesting speakers this morning on a variety of topics. As you mentioned, Dave Brand from Walnut Creek Seeds is going to be talking about different seeds, crop sales and organ non-organic, uh, organic and uh, other um, conventional and non-conventional uh, seeding for a variety of uh, users. 
Um, also, we have uh, Kevin Kelly from Terra Vita Farms, which is in Woodstock, Illinois. And with, then, it's, as uh, Brandon mentioned, Dr. Emily Heaton will, will close up. She's professor of crop sciences at the University of Illinois. And uh, Dr. Heaton has uh, either co-authored or authored over 52 papers on their, her topic. So she's got a lot of interesting information, as do the other speakers for all of you today. Um, I again would like to, as Brandon did, thank our sponsors uh, who are the Natural Land Institute and the Illinois Division of the Isaac Walton League. I also um, like to thank very much for helping to sponsor and, and promote this today, Chicago Wilderness and the University of Illinois Extension. So uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Um, don't get your questions ready and uh, Remember to enter those into the chat area. And thank you again for coming and I'll turn it back over to Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much. Um, now I'd like to invite to the Zoom stage um, our first panelist this morning, David Brandt. David Brandt farms 950 acres, all no-till in Fairfield County, which is located in central Ohio. He began no-till farming in 1971 and has been using cover crops since 1978. David has participated in yield plots for corn, soybeans, and wheat into various covers. He is co-owner of Walnut Creek Seeds, LLC, with his son and daughter-in-law, Jay and Ann Brandt. David has had articles, many articles published, um, including in Farm Journal, Ohio Farmer, Country Journal, and numerous no-till journals. And he's worked in cooperation with Ohio State University, the University of Illinois, Penn State University, Purdue, and Milan um, Research Farm in Tennessee. David has also received many awards for conservation practices, among them the Ohio EPA Nonpoint Pollution Winner, Ohio Conservation Farmer, Ohio Conservation Educator Award from the Ohio No-Till Council, and he was appointed to the rank of Chevalier of Agri Agriculture Merit by the French Minister of Agriculture in 2016. Um, and so with no further ado, I'd like to invite David to, to um, deliver his presentation. Well, it's a privilege to be on uh, this Zoom with everyone. Uh, our, of course, uh, I like to start showing you where we're from, a little bit about us. This is a picture of our farmstead uh, on the farm. Uh, we're south of Columbus, Ohio, about uh, 22 miles. Uh, we're probably in the fastest growing county as far as urbanization goes. For the last 10 years, we've been losing about 45 to 5,000 acres a year to development. So it's quite interesting to farm where we're at. Uh, the reason I got started in conservation tillage and no-till and cover crops was because we were farming highly erodible land. And each year the fields look like this. So this is why I got started. Uh, and it wasn't about regenerative land. It wasn't about learning how to cut down on nutrients. It was just trying to curb the erosion because I thought it was a problem that we had that we had to address. As we look at cover crops, we always look at cover crops that will bring us the advantage of capturing nitrogen from the atmosphere, bringing beneficial insects to our farm, uh, looking at things that we can do to make our cropland more productive and uh, Throughout this presentation, I hope I can show you how we've done that with the use of the cover crops we've worked with. Uh, I just wanted to put a picture in how, what we plant into. We normally plant into a six or an eight way cover that survives the winter, usually after a small grain crop, and we'll talk more about that here later. But we usually run in, into uh, a green biomass uh, that weighs somewhere around 18 to 20,000 pounds at planting time. Uh, I begin my venture in uh, 78 with using single species uh, after wheat uh, because uh, we tried three or four years just straight no-till and about the third year into it we saw some reduction in yield and I know when I asked some people well you'll have to plow to loosen that soil and I thought well we need to find a better way because at that point we didn't have the opportunity to spend time in the field with the amount of livestock that we had. We had, we was operating a 200 cow calf operation. 
that sold the steers and the heifers off. And we also had a 200 sow fair to the finish house and me and my wife did all the work. So uh, there wasn't time for field preparation. So as we looked at cover crops, we looked at Austin winter pea and this seeding rate was 30 pounds and they're about 65 cents a pound. So it's a really, really economical crop to use. It captures a lot of nitrogen. And what I like to show is that as these root plants grow, you'll see the nodulation there in the soil. And what I'm trying to say here, this nodulation releases about uh, 35 to 40 days after we plant corn and terminate the top growth. And from that, then we can collect a lot of atmospheric nitrogen that will the corn plant can utilize to lower our cost of uh, inputs that we have to buy. Uh, hairy vetch was another one we used. Uh, it was quite a challenge because of uh, it tends to not be very tall, but it seems to tangle on everything that we tried to use, like row cleaners and spike closing wheels. So presently, we are working with just a fluted colder and a smooth rubber wheel on our planter uh, and able to do a really nice job planting our corns in these covers. During the year, during the late 80s and early 80s, I was trying to figure out how much nitrogen I could accumulate from the atmosphere from the roots of the plants that we were looking at. And I went to a couple of universities and everyone told us we had to put the green biomass underneath the soil to release the nitrogen. And I just didn't want to do that. So we'd run three years, we run trials where we had these legume cover crops planted in like a 30 or 40 acre field. And we did our own yield evaluations where we put zero nitrogen on up to 200 pounds. And wherever the corn equaled, the 200 bushel per acre, I figured that was the pounds of nitrogen each one of these uh, legume crops produced for us. So as we look at the list of legumes, we have a lot of cool season legumes such as red clover, sweet clover, crimson clover, hairy vetch, cahaba vetch, and winter pea. And then we did some work with a warm season legume such as cow peas and sun hemp. In our mixes today, we're using eight to 10 after wheat. And we're using cow peas and sun hemp and winter peas and hairy vetch and crimson clover because we found those are the ones that will, will capture enough nitrogen that we can get by without using nitrogen for a corn crop after a small grain crop. Uh, so what we're trying to do here, and this is a field that we normally look at, at uh, in the fall. Uh, four to five years ago, we started using sunflowers because before we did that, it was a green looking mess of everything growing. And when you rent a lot of land and the competition for land here is pretty great. Uh, some of my conventional fellow farmers would go to our landlords and say, man, look at that green weed mess Mr. Brandt's got on his farm and uh, we'll make it brown and pay you a little more rent. So we lost a couple fields because they thought they were weeds. We ended up putting sunflowers in our fields uh, and that happens to represent a pound of sunflowers. And guess what? I have uh, 13 landlords, it's over 80 years old and they're all ladies. And you can take three or four sunflowers every Monday in a quart jar with a red ribbon around it. And right now David could do no wrong with those landlords. So it was a real plus for us to have those flowers in our mix. The great thing we found out was that the sunflowers for some reason, found some zinc in the soil and brought it to the surface. And our soil samples showed some zinc deposits coming up as we used our cover crops. So that was a plus. In the early or late 90, 90s, I met Steve Groff and uh, began working him with him with tillage radishes. Uh, this is just a field of radishes that we precisionally planted. Our white planter will plant uh, we have a 15 inch row planter and we use it for 30 inch corn and 15 inch beans. So we plant one row of radishes and one row of alternating either winter peas or oats or depending on what we want to do with it to go on from there. So here's a radish that had a tuber about 22 inches long and a root another three foot deep into the soil. Just a shot of them. One nice thing that we found as we worked with this all these tend to winter kill, so everything's brown in the spring. 
but we do have enough residue left that we didn't have any erosion from. So at that case, we did not need to use a burned down herbicide for these. Uh, the disadvantage when you do it like this is that uh, in March, when they start de going through decomposition, they release a sulfur odor and it does smell like a natural gas leak. So it's a pretty potent odor when you have that many radishes in a field. But what the radish does as it grows, it tends to lift the soil. So we actually have a natural strip till machine if we plant them in 30 inch rows that we can go right back and plant the corn where that reddish was and we pick up all the nutrients from this reddish after it goes through decomposition. We worked with Ohio State University on a five-year study that Dr. Lafik Eslam did and this was the results of the five-year study to find the average nutrients that was found the day we plant corn in the corn rows. So as you can see, we found about 100, 250 pounds of nitrogen, about 23 pounds of extra phosphorus, about 250 pounds of extra potash, some sulfur, some calcium, and magnesium. This taught me that we could start to reduce our inputs quite significantly, and uh, we're now really have reduced our bought in nutrients by at least 90% on our farming operation. I believe in a three-year rotation. On our 900 acres, we have 300 acres of corn, 300 acres of soybeans, and 300 acres of small grains. This makes it really simple for me because we know which field is going to the next crop and we it makes it real easy as long as you can keep it even. By having a small grain in a rotation, we probably lose a little bit of money, not by having a corn and bean rotation, but the advantage of that is to have the cover crop after the small grain, which will grow a large biomass and give us the nutrients we need that we don't have to buy much input costs for corn. So here was a scavenger mix we come up with that I like to use after, after wheat or after a field, maybe you got preventive planting and you've got some nitrogen on and you wanna scavenge it. Uh, this was planted on July the 27th, and this is September the 23rd, and this is how big it grew. Uh, as you can see, we're trying to do things to make uh, our plants have deep roots. And in this field, we had plants that had roots six and a half and seven foot deep. It seems like every year is different. In 2017, we had a really great spring. It warmed up earlier. You can see our cover crops got big. This field had 38,000 pounds of green biomass when we started planting corn. This was a year that we didn't have to use any chemicals or any herbicides because we use a crop roller after planting. We roll the residue down. It really covers up a lot of mistakes that the planter makes. We get a good stand of corn usually, and it don't take a whole lot of management. Every year seems to be different. So as we moved to 18, we had a colder spring. It was damper. The cover crops didn't grow very well. It was about eight inches tall. So here we had to use a burn down herbicide and use some management tools such as maybe a little more nutrients, a little more nitrogen to get our crop to grow. So what I'm saying is as we do from conventional to no-till and cover crops, the management strategy has to be a lot better because you're not spending time doing tillage. Uh, this is how we prepare a field after it was planted. This happened to be one that was in CRP for 10 years. Two months before it come out of contract, we got approval to kill off what was there. We planted a 10-way species. So my wife is rolling what was left in the spring from that cover crop we sowed into the CRP field. We planted corn into it. Uh, this field had about 42,000 pounds of biomass at planting time. And that's why we was rolling ahead because when the marker arm would try to make a mark in this, it would keep breaking the shear pins. And uh, I got tired of crawling in and out of the cab and replacing bolts. But here's the stand of corn we got after we rolled that cover crop with no fertilizers and no herbicides. I was quite impressed with what we saw. As we see our cover crops, we increase our beneficial uh, ability to things. And so we have not used a fungicide or insecticide on our farm for 10 years. And five years ago, we are 
not using treated seeds anymore where we have cover crop. What I wanna show here is with our cover crops, our soils are cooler during the summer. Uh, so we do delay planting about two weeks prior to when our conventional neighbors start. But with that soil being warmer during the summer, that corn catches up so we don't have a delay in harvest. Usually our corn's one or 2% drier than our neighbor's corn is. And you can see by the uh, temperature gauge there was about 97 degrees on the conventional field, but it was only 78 degrees where there is cover. This is a shot of our cover crops with our planter setting in the corner of it there. That's the frame of the planter. Just to give you an idea how tall it is, what you see there in bloom is uh, winter peas and uh, crimson clover. There's some hairy veg down underneath. The buckwheat has already bloomed and went to seed and the rye. When the rye has a head like this with the pollen you see coming off of it, you can crimp it and actually kill it. Uh, I was fortunate enough that my grandson decided three years ago to come back and be part of the farm operation. And I know the first year we was running it, he, we went to lunch and during lunch, he says, Grandpa, he says, everybody around you has got green planters. He says, why do you have a red one? And I said, well, if we had a green one and we went to lunch and we come back, we probably couldn't find it in the field because it'd be the same color as the cover crop. And he just laughed about that, you know. Uh, just to show you how well we can get along planting in green cover, as long as you don't go out in the field while the cover's growing early in the spring and there's no marks in the field, your marker arm can make a good mark, as you can see in front of the tractor there. And here we're planting corn. This field of corn made 213 bushel a year ago with rye cover and the clovers in it. The neat thing that we're finding out is we are able to make our commodities a lot more nutrient dense. And as we look at nutrient denses in our products, we're able to feed higher proteins to our animals which means our animals are more healthy, which I think will have a response back to the public with healthier livestock, with more protein in it, we'll have healthier human beings. So as you can see, without fertilizer on a cover crop field, we're running about 9% protein. We do lots of trials, so we used half rate fertilizer and we lowered the protein by almost one point. When we went our full rate, we used an agronomist to help us and he says, you got to keep buying fertilizer because I sell it to you, David. So we put out a plot with his full rate of fertilizer and our protein went to 7.5. The fields that we have with no cover crop that we've just taken over, the protein in the corn was five. So 9% protein feeding the livestock means a whole lot less soybean meal you have to buy to balance your ration. We are now growing organic or open pollinated corns to feed our livestock because some of our open pollinated corns now is testing 11, 12, and 13% this year, which is a great thing to feed hogs. Everyone wants to know how expensive is it to grow cover crops? Well, our blended species are about $25 an acre planted after wheat. That would be a 10 way species. We're using non-GMO seed. We plant about 31,000 or 32,000, so it's about $66.81 an acre for the seed. Uh, we normally don't have a burn down, but one out of about every three or four years we do have to, so we put our cost in for the average of those years. It costs us $9.72 for burn down a year. A little bit of starter fertilizer some years is $28. That happens to be all N, P, and K that we use. The $55 is the actual cost of fuel, tires, equipment, oils, repair, and those kind of things. Our average cash rent on our farms around is $150. Uh, so our out-of-pocket cost is $334 an acre. Uh, these figures are from 18, so corn was $3.11 an 18. It took us 107.6 bushel to break even. We averaged 192 bushel that year, and we made $262.26 to pay the fixed cost and have some profit from our corn. The neat thing of it is you've all seen yield maps out of combines. I talked my grandson in, I said, I'm really not concerned about the yield. I would like to know whether these fields are making us profit per acre. So this happens to be a profit per acre per map. 
And red means we're not making much. Yellow, we're making a little bit. And green means we got money to put in the bank. The big right angle you see there on the left-hand side of that, that happens to be a waterway that we go across. And on the corners is where the deer eat all the corn. I think it's well worth looking at your yield maps to see what you're doing as far as return on your investment. We talked about insects and what we do there. And this is my favorite insect. This is called a crabbit beetle. He eats slugs. He'd probably eat uh, five or six slugs every night. We have somewhere between 30 and 40 of these, probably in every half acre to acre we find, because when you take a shovel full, you can find one or two in a shovel full. They also eat uh, foxtail weeds and some common ragweed seed weeds. So they also help us with some of our herbicide programs. Uh, we have a lot of beneficial insects and we've only found about five or six harmful ones. And that's why we quit using insecticide or fungicide. We do get guys that wanna know whether you can burn things off early. You can. Uh, I think the problem we have in our area, we don't pay our weatherman enough because he'll tell, tell us we'll have a drought and, it, and we'll get worried about the cover crop pulling out too much moisture. So then we'll spray it and it turns brown. About the time we're ready to plant corn, it rains about four or five inches and then the soil's too wet. And when you do it this way, it's hard to get the soil dried out to plant corn in. You may have to plant late beans and change your system. So that's why we normally always plant green, but you wanna make sure you want to have the plant totally brown to use a planter because it will hairpin if it is dark blue or light green, a halfway dead. We prefer to plant this way. We plant all our corn and soybeans this way with our planter and we try to get the cover crop as big as possible because we're, we're trying to conserve the erosion, but we also want the biomass to suppress the weeds. Uh, we're not organic, but I think this works with organics as long as we get enough biomass there to hold the weeds down. I borrowed this from Rick Clark. He's a friend of mine. He's been on our farm. I have not been fortunate enough to be to his, but he's doing great jobs on the Indiana, Ohio, Illinois border. And what I really wanted to show you was, if you look down the chart there at the 28 inch tall rye, he found in his 28 inch tall rye that he had 134 pound of nitrogen, 64 pounds of, uh, or 30 pounds of K2O, uh, 169 pounds of potash, some sulfur, some, uh, some manganese, some calcium, and the biomass was 6,800 pounds. If we can grow these cover crops and we're starting to look and understand carbon credits, uh, I've heard the price of carbon credits from 20 to 40 to $80 a ton. So here Rick could actually collect, if he was in the carbon credit system, probably about 35 or 40 bucks an acre just through carbon credits, which is gonna make his farm a lot more profitable than where he did not have covers. I want to show you a picture of our soybeans emerging through the rye. Uh, we find if we can do this after corn, we increase our bean yields by four or five percent just because the rye is there. We also see the rye suppress some of the problem weeds like mare's tail and giant ragweeds. We also can conserve the erosion so we don't have to use as much nutrients. And uh, it's just real easy to harvest because the combine rolls about three to 4% easier with the cover crop than where you have bare soil. So it's an all, all these things add to uh, pluses to the bottom line. Uh, this is a field of beans that had rye in it in 13. They made 72 bushels the acre and we did not use a herbicide, we rolled them. But I just wanted to show you how close the nodes and pods were on these beans. And I think that's because the uh, rye ties up the nitrogen as that beans emerging and then releases it about 60 to 70 days later to feed it when it's gonna set pods and seed. Our costs for cover crops uh, for soybeans are $9. We're using non-GMO beans. We quit six years ago using GMO varieties and we've increased our yield since then. 
So our seed cost was $42. We used no fertilizer. Our equipment cost is less because all we use is a planter and a drill and a combine. Our cash rent's the same. You can see our cost was $235.28 an acre. In 18, the beans were worth $8.40. It took 28 boosts to break even. We averaged 72, so we had a net return of $369.52 an acre, which has been fairly profitable for us to do this with a cover crop. Again, a yield map or a, a, a return on investment map of a farm. The right-hand side is 50 years of no-till. You'll see the little white gap in between there. And the left-hand side was a new farm we just bought four years ago. So we've got a lot of improvements to do on a new farm. But that gap is a trench we had to cut in to put three-phase power in. It was five foot deep and 30 inches wide. And you can just see there that we're not getting much yield off of that yet. It's been a long struggle to get that to come back after we dig had dug that trench in the soil. We do a lot of test plot work, and I just want to show you some of the things that we've learned from our test plots. This was an 18. Everything's the same other than the variety. So all these eight varieties or nine varieties were treated the same. The left-hand side, you can see the herbicide costs and all those things that we come up with. Uh, the next column is maturity. So I want you to look down to the 111-day maturity. That was 6105 and 6115. Two varieties from spectrum seed corn planted the same population. You look over there at return for variety. One of them returned $59.66 and the other one was $228.78. Guess what? David does not plant much or any of the 6105 anymore. It is important, I think, as you do some test work on your own farm to figure out which varieties respond better to your cover crops. We have a high boy seeder. We do a lot of interseeding work at Tossel or after uh, and have got along really well. And that's been quite successful. And we usually have about 80% of our cover crops sown before harvest starts. Uh, we're looking in to do some other research at B4s and B5s, trying to see how successful that's been. So far, we have not been as successful as I'd like to be. Uh, we are learning what varieties of cover crops to use. And I think the next year we'll have a handle on that and be able to talk more about that uh, with the things we've done. I wanted to show you some cover. This is legume covers where we're going back to corn, two years of corn. So here we've put clovers and things in. It's gonna grow underneath the corn to uh, have some nitrogen for next year's corn. Maybe help with a little nitrogen for this year's corn. I'm not sure that it does. Uh, this is radishes and rye going to soybeans the next year. And you can see a pretty nice stand of corn at harvest time. This was a bean field that we put winter peas and hairy vetch and crimson clover in. You could barely see it when we cut the beans off. And this is a picture two and a half weeks later, how it thickened up and got sunlight and grew really well. This is a rye field that will go to beans and uh, for the next year through our air seeder. Again, I wanted to show you just our cover crops. And if you look at the top of the picture, you'll see our woodlot behind there. And what I'm trying to do is manage our cover crop like a woodlot. You know, our woodlot's never been fertilized. It's been there forever. We still have trees growing there. We have fairly good soil health evidently because the trees are still growing, but they're different species and different sizes. So in our cover crops, we have stuff that's six or seven foot tall down to three inches tall. So we have a root mass from a half an inch deep to five or six inches deep, which brings up a lot of nutrients below the plow pan, bring them to the surface so we can utilize in the next growing years. The best thing we can do with those cover crops is feed part of it through the livestock. When we can do this, we can actually not ever buy nutrients again, as long as you got some livestock to eat some of those covers off and when you mob graze and if you can get a cow pie and a urine pie and a cow pie touching each other, you do a great job of spreading the nutrients from those cattle. Cattle on our cover crops has been gaining three and a half to five and a half, four and a half pounds a day eating these covers. 
Uh, we do a lot of research with Green Acres uh, at Cincinnati, and these are their calves and their pictures, and I appreciate them sharing that with us so we could share today. Crop rollers, they're all sizes and kinds. Uh, this happens to be one that we rent out to garden people that don't want to just uh, walk on it. Uh, it's about a $700 roller. We have another roller we sell, and it's a two by four with a quarter, three quarter inch hang iron bolted to it and two rubber bungee cords. That's my son for a year, you know, but you can still, you can see behind him, he can mash it down and you can plant your garden and do those things all you want to do. We're going to have fun now because since we've lost some acres, we're trying to do more retail sales. So we're great in no-till pumpkins. This happens to be a probably a 50 acre permanent pasture field that we burn off with a herbicide. Uh, this is a pumpkin planter that we designed. Uh, I call it my precision planter because on the press wheel, we have a red mark. At the center of the picture, you can see a funnel. There's a 50 gallon or five gallon can between the man's legs. There's pumpkin seeds in it. When he sees a red mark, these are two seeds in the funnel and we're off and running. At about 10 o'clock, he was complaining. So I give him some air conditioning. And about one o'clock, we have to transfer the weight. So it'll go in the ground. So we take the 250 pounder off and put the 400 pounder on and we can plant pumpkins. And this happens to be my wife in the pumpkin patch. This is how nice the pumpkins grow in that field. Directly behind her right left shoulder, you'll see the reason why there's 500 homes back there on a 200 acre farm that we farmed two years before. The pumpkins has been a real asset to our operation, whether you pick and uh, uh, about five acres of pumpkins are equal to 100 acres of corn. I wanna put in this profile of our soils because if you look at down at the bottom here, you'll see this is called Carlington yellow clay soils. When we started in 1971, it was a profile of total yellow. Now we have about a 20 inch profile of dark colored soils. You'll see some little yellow lesions here. Uh, my goal in the next six years to have 42 inches of dark colored soils instead of yellow underneath there. By having cover crops that build mycorrhiza fungi and other fungi that helps feed the corn plant and the bean plants and what we do, this is, a, this is one you can see with your naked eye and we, you will not see this when you have conventional because they, as you add oxygen to that, it oxidizes all and goes back up in the atmosphere. The idea is to have clean water. On the right, you'll see clean water. On the left, you'll see water coming from our conventional farmers around us. Uh, this is a shot of our waterway. After a two and a half rainfall event in 17, you can see we have clean water. And across the road from us, it looks like this. My last picture, just want to show you that we are preparing. We have readiness for the next year and we have nice looking corn. So I do thank you for the opportunity to share my information and the things we've learned is from having uh, success and also having failures because I think I learned more by having failures than having success. So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Wonderful, David. Thank you so much um, for that really inspiring presentation and for being with us today. Um, we definitely have some time for some questions. We have some great questions that have come in. Um, let's start with a couple of questions about equipment. Um, we had a question about, you know, to plant in the green cover crop, do you need special equipment to do that? Uh... I don't think you do. There's a lot of good things out there. If you're using a single species, you can use row cleaners. They'll work fairly well. Uh, you can use spike closing wheels to help close up the trench. As you move from a single species to multiples and five ways and 10 ways, once you get a five or a 10 way in, the soil particles get more granular. The soil gets softer. You'll see that that soil closes a lot easier behind the seed disc. Uh, as you go to those crops that you have more vegetation, it tends to be longer. You'll learn to either raise up the row cleaners or take them off. Uh, 
We do have trouble with spike closing wheels, wrapping, and hairy vetch and winter pea. Uh, so we have just, all we have on our planter right now is a fluted colder and rubber press wheels. And we have tried all, about everything that's been made to make it work. The reason we don't like road cleaners on our operation is most of our soils are from six to 20% slopes. So if we move that residue any and leave the soil bare, we have erosion problems. So I just believe cut the slot and push the residue back over the top of it with the, with the closing wheels. And I think it works really well. Excellent. Before we get to the next question, David, you know, I'd love to invite you to, you can stop sharing your screen. Um, and if you wanna go ahead and click the start video um, button down at the bottom of your screen so we can see your face. We'd love to, we'd love to see your face while Let's you're answering. That. There, there you go, we can see you. Okay. Excellent. All right, um, so another question about equipment. We had somebody who's interested in getting started in, in, in cover crops. And what suggestion do you have for necessary bare minimum equipment that I would need to get started on less than 100 acres? And, and is there any financial planning templates or anything that may be out there to, get, to help get started? Well, I guess to start, you know, I guess I would look at, uh, if you're in a corn bean rotation, uh, I would look at using rye after corn. Uh, it really doesn't matter how you get it out there. I like to see it put in with a drill because you can le use less pounds of seed. If you're using a drill, you're probably in a neighborhood of 20 to, to 40 pounds of seed of rye. Uh, if you don't have that availability and you may have a disc, you can spread it, set your disc so it only cuts about an inch deep, uh, move a little bit of soil over that. If you don't like that approach, I just put it in the broadcast spreader and spread it. Uh, you'll have to be at about 60 or 70 pounds because only 50% of it's going to grow. But I think that's a good way to get started and get used to looking at a cover crop. Uh, as far as financial goes, there's uh, you can go to your soil and water office or your ASCS office. Uh, they do have equipped programs in just about every state in the United States. Uh, there's some cost share available uh, to the tune of... Uh, the lowest I've heard has been $15 and the highest has been 30 or 40. Uh, and there's also a CSP that'll work with you if you're changing your practices. I think that's one way to help to get started. Uh, and I think as you learn to do that and you can venture into more details as you learn to how to look at that cover uh, as a uh, green cover on the ground. Excellent. We have a couple of questions about about your carbon being stored, um, and let's start with how. What method are you using to quantify how much carbon is being stored in the soil in your fields? Uh, well, we do uh, we do a green biomass uh, uh, at planting time. What we do, we take a three foot square, harvest it, weigh it, uh, send it off for nutrients in the green biomass then hang it up in the barn, let it dry. And we can convert that then to dry matter. Uh, we also send the soil off and get a nitrogen to carbon ratio that we can do. And uh, we presently do not sell carbon credits yet, uh, mainly because most of our soils are from five to 8% organic matter. And uh, it's hard to change them much faster than that right now. As a follow-up, do you um, measure carbon storage in the soil in your CRP lands? Uh, have not done that, no. Great. Um, we've had a number of questions about sort of recruiting other farmers, if you, as it were, to, to doing things like this too. Um, you said that you delay planting corn, so you're about two weeks after your neighbors. Um, have you noticed any difference there? Uh, not really. I think, I think, uh, the reason we delay is I, I, I like to see the corn, corn come up uh, within three or four days after planting. Uh, I see no reason to go out there April 1st uh, to be the first one out. And then you have problems with, in, if we was, if you have problems with insects, the soil's being cold, uh, you know, those kind of things. So we, we, we've moved our planting date back. We've also moved back maturity dates uh, 
about 110 day average is where everybody is here. We're about 102 to 100. We're seeing our 100 day corns uh, coming up quick, uh, averaging 190 to 210. Uh, and we're harvesting the same time or a week and a half earlier than our neighbors, which allows us to put a cover crop in to get a little more growth out of it before winter terminates it or slows it down. Here's a follow-up to that question, David. Um, does this delay help you out avoiding any spring flooding? Yes, most definitely. Most definitely. Excellent. Have you seen um, any more farmers in your area start to incorporate similar practices in their operations over the past few years? Uh, I'll clarify that. Our surrounding farms around us have not. I go two miles, five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles away, and we have lots and lots of producers that we're working with that are doing what we're doing and are quite successful with it. That's excellent. Do you have any insights about encouraging landowners to become committed to conservation oriented farming? So how can we get, how can we, you know, how can we preach out there, you know, how great this is? Well, I think, I think, I think the, you know, it's really, it's going to be tough when, you know, corn is $5 and 50 cents and, and beans are $15. You can do about anything and still make some money. But, you know, when, when the prices fall back, you know, as we look at building soil, uh, regenerating soil, building more organic matter, uh, in, increase water infiltration, you know, if we can add a half to a, to an inch of organic matter a year by having large biomasses, we can increase the water holding capacity from, from 10,000 gallons to 27,000 gallons, depending on how much organic matter you can put there. We also add about 25 pounds of nitrogen being held by that organic matter. Uh, when we lower the, the out-of-pocket cost, uh, we lower the fuel consumption because the planter pulls easier, the combine rolls easier, the sprayer rolls easier. Uh, these are all things that I think that we can talk to landowners or producers about and let them understand that there is a better way. I think if we don't change and keep doing what we're doing, that uh, uh, we may have some regulations we do not like. So I'd rather be proactive and try to show producers how we can uh, uh, be uh, more, uh, I don't like the word sustainable, regenerative and make things work a lot better. Sort of along those lines, what kind of changes could be made to CRP and similar programs to get more long-term participation from farmers? Well, I think, I think you know, CRP is great, but normally they only got one species. You know, you go around and look at CRP fields and they got one grass or they got two grasses. You know, I think CRP farms should be, should have a diverse cover crop. I mean, you know, we're just talking about doing things for diversity. You know, let's, let's make these these plants out there are more diverse. Let's make sure that they can do things uh, and make it work a lot better. I would like to see them change all their equip programs and CSP programs to make them longer. Uh, you know, uh, CSP is long. You can, you can be in that as long as you want to, but equips usually two or three years. You get paid for two or three years. And then as soon as the funding run out, uh, the farmer may have a problem with it. And then he'll go back to doing what he was doing before because uh it takes a lot more management to handle these fields in a regenerative farming practice than it does when it's conventional. We have a couple of questions about some of the terminology and some of the practices. What does hairpin mean in regard to half alive cover crops? Well, hairpin means that the fluted colder didn't cut the residue and it actually pushed that residue in a slot. So it actually, if you would take a pencil and break it to it, it would, that would be like the residue sticking down in a trench. And when you have that residue in a trench, it tends to dry it out. It acts like a straw to pull the moisture away from the sidewall. So when that, when that grain that you planted sprouted, it will usually sprout a little bit and then die because of lack of moisture. So if we can keep the commodity on top of the ground from hair painting, you're a lot better off. Excellent. Who creates your ROI maps? Uh, my grandson does uh, uh, through uh, uh, an ag leader program that we're using, SMS Basic. Excellent. 
Um, are any of your cover crops considered native species to your area? Native species to our area. Uh, I, I guess I don't know how to answer that. I don't think so. I mean, you know, they, we can grow we can grow the cereals uh, that we use in our seed business, uh, uh, but some most of everything we have to get imported here to put with our cover crops. Yes. Got it. How do herbicides affect mycorrhizal fungi? Uh, some herbicides have a tendency to have long residuals, which uh, probably don't bother the mycorrhizae so much as if you did the tillage part. You know, uh, I think we've seen we've seen some cases where maybe some herbicides have uh, affected the uh, growth of the mycorrhiza instead of letting it. Uh, do its thing, it kind of just stymies it where it's at in the soil, if that helps answer that question. Excellent. You talked about sort of the past few years and, and went, you know, in great kind of depth in terms of, of your budget, um, but sort of thinking about it in big picture terms, sort of like over the decades, what was your approximate transition from unprofitable with cover crops to profitable? Do you have, like, how long did that transition take to become profitable? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, I think the part of the hardest part I had to learn was as we put legumes in the mix and as we, as we used our cover crop to slow down the erosion, you know, when I started in 71, we were eroding somewhere around 10 ton per acre because of our, our practice we were doing. So we were losing a lot of nutrients just from the soil loss. Uh, I think as we, brought our erosion down and presently we erode less than 100 pounds per acre a year now. Uh, you know, so our nutrients are not leaving. Uh, the, the hardest thing I thought was our ground was saying we had to put this and this on. And uh, as we learned to reduce, uh, we didn't need it. It was, a, it was a, a monumental goal for me. So I think you can see it in the first year or two, you'll really see it three, four, and five years after you begin no-till and cover crop. Excellent. And we have one more question, you know, about sort of carbon sequestration. Um, and the, the questioner asks, my sense is that the CRP field probably sequesters more carbon than, than your farm fields. And what do you make of all the carbon released once the CRP transitioned from native species you know, to sort of from conservation to crops. Do you have any sense of that or any? Well, I, I think we, I, I know we can build more carbon with our blended species than we can with CRP. That's a given. Excellent. That's a given. Excellent. David, thank you so much um, for being with us. Um, that was it for the questions. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you for, for sharing your time and your insights with us, with us today. And share my video. There we go. Um, we did have a question, a couple of sort of station channel questions. Um, are we recording this? Um, yes, Laura, I believe if, if you want to correct me, but I believe, yes, we are recording this session. Um, so we will be able to have that available for you. Um, and then also, I know that we were, we were hoping to do a poll um, this morning for our attendees. And I was just wondering um, if we have that poll available, and if not, maybe we can deploy it a little bit, a little bit later. So before I bring Kevin on, um, just wondering if we have that poll. Yes, we we are recording this, and we will be posting the link, and we can share it with the re with the registrants afterwards as well. And I'll launch the poll now. Wonderful, thank you, Laura. So if we're very curious about, about sort of who's here on the webinar today um, and sort of your, and some of your experiences. So we have a quick, we have a quick two question poll um, that Laura is launching in just a moment. So if you can take a moment to, to take that poll, we would appreciate it in understanding who is with us today. There's the poll coming up right now. So we'd love to get those answers. And while we're doing the poll, just a quick thank you again to our sponsors, 
the Natural Land Institute, the Illinois Division, and the Illinois Division of the Isaac Walton League. So thank you again. And now I would love to invite to the stage Kevin Kelly um, while, you, while our attendees are taking the, that poll. Kevin Kelly is a co-founder of Terra Vitae Farms along with his wife Katie and Colleen and Michael Biver, their daughter and son-in-law. Terra Vitae Farms is located in Woodstock, Illinois and focuses on growing the cleanest food conceivably possible by using regenerative farming techniques to grow and manage their livestock. The farming enterprise is four years old and produces pork, beef, lamb, goat, and chicken for direct sale to consumers and farm to table restaurants. I'm very pleased to welcome Kevin um, to our virtual Zoom stage this morning. Hey, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciated uh, Dave's presentation. Uh, again, great learning for me, and uh, I hope uh, to share with you our uh, experience uh, from Terra Vitae Farms. I'm going to begin uh, sharing my screen now with uh, uh, my uh, uh, PowerPoint. And I'll just uh, verify that uh, that can be seen. So uh, again, as uh, Brandon mentioned, uh, I, along with my wife, Katie, and our daughter, Colleen, and her husband, Michael, and their four children. So it's a multi-generational farming enterprise. Uh, we operate Terra Vitae Farms, uh, again, just uh, north of Woodstock, Illinois. Um, but we chose this name to uh, describe our general philosophy of our work and vision for the farm and that's earth and life. Our vision is to produce the healthiest food possible. And as uh, Brandon mentioned, we just established uh, the farm a little over four years ago. So I'd have to admit we're still in the beginning stages and in the learning environment. But uh, what I will share today is mostly our experiences so far in this uh, endeavor. So, uh, I'd have to say due to several different reasons of why, of why we got into this uh, a project to, to begin with, we all arrived at the same conclusion that it was our obligation to get our hands dirty and do our part to bring to the table what we considered to be the healthiest food possible. So we decided to focus our agriculture efforts on meat production, still being committed though, to leaving the land in better condition than when we started. Uh, hence, our tagline is better for you, better for them, and better for the earth. And this uh, is an example of some of the uh, meat products we produce, um, just to say that this was a, a subscription package uh, sample that we uh, uh, do, uh, did uh, just a few uh, months ago, and it was a, a nice successful operation that uh, people could subscribe, then we would deliver these. And so our economic model in this case was to produce um, a package, a sampler package that uh, people could then subscribe to and then have it delivered to their homes every two weeks. Uh, from the better for you standpoint, uh, I'd say this is really starting with the end in mind, uh, producing the healthiest food possible, but there are also benefits to you and I we'll look at the health benefit uh, that uh, is, um, is there. Um, I guess it it's thinks uh, around the philosophy of not only you are what you eat, but you are what you eat eats. Um, we uh, raise our animals without any chemical inputs uh, with a rare exception of maybe a dire emergency uh, for the survival of the animal. And all of the animals are exclusively pasture raised with the exception of some grain inputs to the pigs and chickens because their uh, diet uh, needs the additional proteins and so forth. In the case where we do feed, uh, they're all non-GMO ingredients. And in the end, the inputs to the animal throughout its life are the food that they would normally find in nature. So not only is the food raised this way cleaner, but it's free of toxic chemical inputs but it's also more nutrient dense. And I do recall that uh, Dave mentioned that same uh, uh, term nutrient density with regard to the, uh, the plant life that he's producing as well and demonstrated that in the uh, protein uh, 
chart that he showed. So this is an example of uh, pork that's raised on uh, our farm compared to some pork chops that uh, I just went out and, and bought at a conventional, conventional store just to show the comparison. Um, you can see that uh, the rich red meat from the pig that was raised on the pasture and the non-GMO grains and in a non-confined environment compared to a conventionally raised pork it's a more pale whitish color, also lacking in the flavor uh, and nutritional elements of the pasture raised meat. The pasture raised meat has less saturated fat, more heart healthy polyunsaturated fats and higher levels of protein and vitamin E. And uh, the source uh, for that is the uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust fact sheet that uh, I've re referred to, but that's also supported by uh, a very extensive bibliography of uh, uh, peer-reviewed uh, articles and so forth that demonstrate and have tested for those kinds of um, um, the uh, value and nutrient density in those kinds of meats. Eggs, on the other hand, we look at and see the difference in eggs raised in a conventional, conventional confinement facility, uh, even given organic feed, so therefore can be said to be organic eggs compared to eggs from chickens that are fed non-GMO grains and are allowed to free range and eat bugs and grasses in their expanded environment. The free range eggs are of course higher in omega-3 fats and uh, vitamins A, D and E, according to a Penn State study. So that's the, uh, the better for you component that I've talked about. I'll return to that a little later uh, when I, look at a more holistic view of the idea of better for you. Better for them. We do practice a extensive rotational grazing operation. Uh, it involves, uh, of course, that we need to observe and respond to what the uh, animals are doing and, and how they're uh, acting. For us on the scale that we are uh, operating upon, it's a, about 70 acres at, at this point where we're raising our uh, livestock, but our practice is to give them good, healthy plants to eat and then move them frequently from, from one grazing space to another so as not to overtax the land by overgrazing it, but also to have the animals in place long enough to help them improve the land. Uh, similar to Dave's earlier presentation where you saw the, uh, the cows uh, uh, consuming some of the cover crops, but of course their droppings and urine and so forth helped again to uh, rebuild that soil with the nutrients that they're passing through. Here, uh, I've just moved a round bale feeder from this area, and so they're uh, cleaning up what was left in a nice small meadow. And then you can see in the background, and I'll see if I, my cursor can show it, uh, another uh, uh, round bale feeder here that the, uh, these uh, sheep are cleaning up on. We do uh, often have multi-species together in their grazing. Um, uh, so that, uh, you know, again, in, in the biodiversity of the whole operation, it's not just um, one plant, but it's not just one animal either. We also uh, try to uh, have an approach of balanced human intervention. So uh, we don't uh, try to overreact to something, but if there's a, um, an animal that's in need of assistance, uh, we will uh, step in where we see that that's needed. Of course, every, every farmer who is had animals knows that uh, sometimes they get in trouble and need some, some help. Um, I guess I'd share a short experience that we had uh, last spring where uh, my wife Katie noticed uh, a mama goat uh, seemed to be struggling to give birth. Uh, we didn't have the goat. We normally don't put our animals inside a, a barn uh, to, uh, to Pharaoh or to, uh, to give birth. We just have them uh, do it in the, in the outside as they would in nature. Uh, but we observed that this goat was, was having difficulty at the time. And so uh, we thought, well, maybe we better try to assist her. So after a few hours, we could see that she was not able to do, deliver on her own. And so uh, we uh, uh, captured her uh, and then uh, my son-in-law, Mike, uh, reached in to pull the baby out, but we could not get a grip on it to free it. 
ended up calling the veterinarian who then talked us through a way to tie a string around the jaw and we're able to, to pull it out. Uh, after about an hour of, of pulling, uh, the baby came out and it was alive. And then there was another one, not quite as big, right behind it. And uh, luckily it was also born alive and uh, the mama goat survived as well. I have to admit that not all of our interventions or decisions to not intervene have ended so well, and we have made a lot of mistakes, but we continue to learn from those experiences as well. I'd have to say that the decisions on how and when to intervene have also led to some deep debates and discussions among us on how we manage the farm and care for the animals. We always are thinking, where is it that we are making this better for them? When is the right time and what constitutes an extraordinary intervention? There are moments when different ideas and thoughts and actions are often about life and death situations and stakes are high with full awareness of everyone. And it's at that moment that can be packed with a lot of emotion around that and lead to misunderstandings. So we often find ourselves having to keep the dialogue going, asking questions, but also sharing our own personal challenges and thoughts, but ultimately hoping to come back to the point where we're treating the animal with the respect and love and relationship that it deserves. This is a comparison of uh, a pasture raised hog on Terravite farms. This is uh, where it's uh, out actually roaming in the woods. Uh, and, uh, this is about a three acre paddock where that pig actually farrowed out there. You can see a small uh, baby pig underneath it and compared to what might be a conventionally raised hog farm. We like to uh, work toward Pharaoh to finish. Um, here's a pig again. I, I say that it, this, these, these pigs were born in that same woods that you saw earlier. Uh, and these piglets uh, pretty much all survived. I, I don't recall her losing one of those. Um, and of course we are not able to uh, raise everything from uh, Pharaoh to finish. There are occasions where we have to purchase um, outside animals a, to start our herds or to actually bring outside breeding stock in to um, uh, widen the genetic pool, of course. We also um, provide free choice minerals to our animals. Um, so this allows them, rather than just setting a, a, a multi-mineral block out on the uh, pasture, this box uh, with 20 different compartments of minerals uh, allows the animal to choose what it really needs. And it's very interesting to observe what happens when uh, uh, these animals do that because they serve different seasons of the year um, or different locations where they're, they're um, uh, grazing. They might choose to consume more phosphorus or more boron. Uh, it's really interesting to watch and observe uh, what they're, they're eating. Uh, but uh, it's also been a, a good uh, pass through because the minerals that they consume, probably 50% of that is absorbed into the animal, but then the remainder part is then deposited on the ground through their feces and then goes back into the soil and help replenish the soil. So better for the earth. Um, this is just a quick shot of some, uh, of a, of some soil uh, after we've been, had planted some uh, uh, actually planted a, a little small seedling tree here, as you can see it. And, but the soil is uh, after about two years of our owning it. And actually I thought it showed a lot of improvement. You see an earthworm here. So we see a lot of improvement uh, in the soil. Uh, this is um, um, some ground that we purchased uh, about three years ago in 2018 and uh, had, had worked and grazed it, and, um, and you're going to see in some subsequent slides the, uh, the improvement and growth that has happened there. But um, I think it, it really demonstrates that um, a piece of soil that had been uh, monocropped and in either corn or beans and heavily fertilized and so forth in the years prior can uh, convert uh, pretty quickly back to something that uh, has life within it. 
This is the uh, aerial shot of the ground that I was speaking of and the uh, little soil sample that you saw on the previous slide came from right out here in this uh, middle pasture. I'll uh, refer to um, these pastures a little bit later. This we'll call the front pasture, a south pasture, a middle pasture, and the savanna. And then some various woods. So you can see it, um, it, it's uh, really an ideal spot for us, we feel, for the, the biodiversity that's here, but also for the varied land, for the, for the animals that we have. The goats uh, do extremely well and love uh, being out on the savanna as well as into these woods where they can work on uh, helping us to eradicate some of that honeysuckle and buckthorn that's out there. Uh, right now, during the winter, we have a, a, a paddock uh, that uh, is surrounded uh, this space here with this meadow that's down here. Um, and then uh, we uh, feed some round bales. Uh, that's where you would have seen that earlier picture uh, in this meadow where the uh, animals were grazing on the hay. This shows the contour lines of that uh, same ground just to share with you. So you can see it's nice and rolling, a good slope that's coming down here into this meadow. Um, here in, in field one, some slope going down here. And I just have to t tell you that this uh, picture here was taken, uh, the, was, the overhead is from 2018. And so what you're seeing is um, what was at that time, uh, these were conventionally farmed uh, fields with row crops in them, um, here, here, here. And then the savanna had not had actually any animals on it for, uh, I mean, over 20 or 30 years. Uh, and had not been uh, farmed there. And so I'm going to uh, demonstrate or show to you a little later uh, based on soil samples uh, of what uh, this ground uh, looks like. So uh, this is again one of those fields, April 2018. And even back then, and we're here, here we are out seeding using just a little hand broadcast spreader. I know uh, uh, Dave earlier talked about uh, the benefits of uh, maybe a drill and that this may be could be an inefficient way because you don't get all the, uh, the uh, uh, seeds to take. But for us, this uh, worked well uh, because we didn't, we didn't want to do two things. One is, you know, we had a big debate about whether to disc this field or not to try to smooth it out some more. It had been plowed the fall prior uh, in anticipation of planting corn on it again. Uh, but what uh, we decided to do is rather than compact the soil any further, uh, by running uh, machinery and a disc over it is that we would plant it with an over 30 different species of uh, grasses and peas and uh, daikon radishes were in there, all sorts of, uh, of species of grasses and legumes to help, uh, again, regenerate that soil and build a nice root structure in there that would help it to, uh, to revive. Uh, this is a little over a year later. And you can see uh, the growth that was happening. And yes, those are pigs that are out there grazing in that field. Uh, we use, um, of course, electric netting and are able to uh, make temporary paddocks for them um, uh, in these different pastures. This is October, so another 14 months later. And I, I guess it would be unfair to say, well, you compare an April shot to an, an October shot. Uh, of, the, of the grass and of course it's going to have a lot more green to it but I, I'd rather emphasize more than just the, the lush green that you see there but the variety of the species so it's not a monocrop not a monoculture here but um, a nice lush green field with a variety of plant species that these animals can graze upon. This is only in the span of about a little over two years and already you see this the recovery of that uh, ground through the rotation of the uh, animals on it. This uh, ground had these cows, as you see, but also had, had pigs on it earlier, sheep and goats grazing on this uh, ground um, in various stages uh, through uh, the, the intervening period between when we bought it in April 2018 and here in October 2020. So even uh, you know, less than uh, or a little over two years. These are some soil samples and I, 
I, I want to mention that uh, uh, we had a great partnership with the University of Illinois um, and the School of Landscape Architecture. Um, we were able to uh, work with a student who was uh, doing a master's thesis on uh, uh, landscape architecture. And so part of that included uh, doing some soil samples. So this gives us a great baseline to uh, go forward. So uh, I mentioned earlier and uh, uh, these references to these various fields. This is the soil organic matter, com matter content that was in each of those uh, fields, um, which in the, again, as I say, this provides us a good baseline to go forward. And then an overall soil health rating. This came from the, the lab where we sent the soil sample uh, uh, from a variety of inputs that they build. What is the best uh, um, or, or what's the scale from zero to 25? What's the health rating of that field uh, or, or that soil? And here, this is that middle field where you saw those cows grazing in the previous slide. So you can see that that really did recover well and it's on the, on the way to improvement. I also want to share that uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gabe Brown, uh, who uh, of course is uh, well known to everyone and I highly recommend his book, Dirt to Soil. Um, he gave a presentation to uh, our uh, local community college, McHenry County in Illinois and their Center for Agrarian Learning. And one of his slides he showed where in 1996, his soil organic matter was just a little bit less than this. And this was up in uh, the area where he, near Bismarck, North Dakota. And in 25 years, he's grown through a rotational grazing process and cover crops that, that he's uh, been using, uh, has grown the organic matter uh, content in the soils to about 7%, which is really uh, pretty astounding. So we're hopeful that we'll continue to do something similar through our practices of our rotational grazing um, I think it would, it's, it's good to point out this middle field that had the, the grazing on just for the few years that we had it. And then the savanna, uh, these soil samples came before any grazing ever occurred back there just because of the uh, infrastructure hadn't been put in place yet to actually put animals back there. We have since been able to graze some animals back in that uh, space earlier. Um, I'll share this uh, uh, slide with you. This also comes from um, the uh, young woman who did the master's thesis and gave us some recommendations on this, I'll call it agro-eco restoration of this land. And we've already begun some of these projects. We see this as a very long-term uh, restoration project. Uh, we've planted a number of trees along this uh, hedgerow that uh, again was the first priority per this uh, plan. And uh, those were some seed seedlings that we uh, purchased through the Soil and Water Conservation District here in McHenry County. So we were uh, grateful to have that. Um, if you think back to the uh, 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 slide earlier about the um, carbon or organic, not carbon, but organic matter content, the savanna was back at 2.5 and this middle pasture here was the 3.3. Um, now I, I'm gonna come back and circle back a little bit to the better for you component. We uh, feel that this also uh, has a great benefit for us in our relationship with our community uh, within our, with our family, but the whole uh, idea of the better for you, uh, better for them, better for the earth. So this better for you part, a more holistic look at it as how it's better for us. Uh, this is a, a small pop-up farmer's market from a standpoint of um, the pandemic shifted a lot of things. Uh, this is uh, at a restaurant uh, not far from us that had been a, uh, a, a customer of ours, uh, but had to actually uh, shut down a lot of their operations. And so they hosted a little farmer's market in their uh, parking lot. And this uh, again, helped to um, uh, promote our business. Uh, so more direct retail sales than it had been uh, because our primary market had been through uh, restaurants that we had been supplying both uh, not both uh, near where we are as well as in Chicago. We also have a number of farm visits and tours that uh, we've been fortunate enough to host and uh, a farm of Palooza, which is another uh, engagement uh, area for our community. Uh, it's a, a fundraiser where we partner with a, uh, a barbecue place. We donate a, a pig for a pig roast 
And uh, this is a, uh, a fundraiser for a, a resource center for youth with Down syndrome. Uh, for family, uh, just say it's been a, a great opportunity to help uh, our children learn, our grandchildren learn as well about uh, farming and um, and that just the uh, the great uh, opportunity that that provides for them to uh, grow and understand uh, just what the wonder of nature is and and working with animals. Uh, just like to conclude uh, with this little quote here. Uh, from um, the Land Prairie, uh, Liberty Prairie Foundation, one of our uh, 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 local um, establishments that helps, it's an organization that helps to train aspiring farmers, uh, match some landowners with farmers who could use the land on a temporary basis, and then also manage to uh, restore the land under uh, responsible farming. But uh, as we like to think, uh, it's all about being better for you, better for them, and better for the earth. Uh, with that, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen and uh, open to questions that might be out there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, it's always great to see a plug for Liberty Prairie Foundation. They're a great organization. Um, first question, did you have a background in conventional farming? You know, um, I have to say from a, not, not really. Uh, but um, my son-in-law, Mike, did. Um, he comes from a family that uh, was, uh, does conventional grain farming as well as does some uh, livestock raising in southern Illinois. So he grew up doing that, but also uh, found that uh, he didn't want to continue that, feeling it was uh, not uh, environmentally responsible as well as producing um, food that was uh, containing uh, chemicals that were harmful to health. And so therefore that's why we uh, departed from that. Excellent. Do you encounter loss due to predation? Uh, we have some livestock guardian dogs that help uh, to prevent that. Um, honestly, the, the only loss we've had to predation has been when we've taken some animals to graze on other land and we did have a guardian dog there with them, but that's been the only occasion. Um, on our land that we've had, or we have here, we have not lost animals to uh, coyotes, uh, with the exception of a, of a couple of chickens. And then the, uh, 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 you know what, I, I need to reset that because I'm thinking of coyotes, but we have had hawks, uh, 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 come after our uh, small broilers. And then once we place our dog nearby, our dogs nearby to protect them, that also helps to protect them. So there has been some loss uh, in the chicken uh, arena. And then we have lost uh, a couple of lambs once we, when we had them grazing on a uh, uh, property that a person had wanted us to uh, graze for them. Hmm. Interesting. Um, question, did you plant for a variety of plant species or was that a result of the natural seed bank in the soil? It was a variety of plant species that we ordered and we actually mixed it together ourselves. So we went to several different sources to put together a good wide variety of plants, some that would uh, be perennial and some that were annuals um, uh, that uh, we uh, Dacon radish that you saw uh, the sample in Dave's presentation. We had uh, a whole bunch of that uh, scattered among it. And uh, uh, it was a nice food. Uh, pigs would often eat. They wouldn't dig down and eat the radish so much, but they would love the tops of that. Um, so it became a good food for them. Um, but it was a variety that we uh, really comprised together uh, rather than just uh, what was naturally there. Excellent. In minimum till non-cover crop situations, when livestock are allowed to graze crop fields, soil compaction can occur. Under your tillage crop rotation system, do you experience any problems of this sort? If not, can you speculate why? Um, I'd say why is a couple of reasons. One is uh, through the plant life and the depth of the root structure that's happening. So that helps to, um, like the, the, that, that radish provides a great example of it expanding and and almost uh, tilling the soil. Having pigs go through it also helps to move the soil in a, a natural way, but 
not to have them on there too long where they overroot and, and, and dig up too much to disturb the soil and the, the networks of the, of the fungi and the, uh, the root structures that are already there. So it's a balancing act there. But uh, I think that we're able to overcome uh, compaction uh, through um, a, a balanced grazing approach. Excellent. Continuing thinking of, of the plants, um, where do you purchase your grass seed mixes? Uh, Johnny's uh, seeds, uh, we purchased from there and a couple of others that I can't recall off the top of my head, but that's one of them. Great, time for a few more questions. Um, there are a couple of questions around sort of advice um, for, for folks. And so what are your most important pieces of advice you would have for other beginning farmers who want to get into regenerative grazing a land that was not originally pasture, and in general, any advice on financial planning for starting a new enterprise like this from scratch? Um, as far, I'll go, I'll go this, the last, second part first, is the, uh, the financial structure is to, um, I say go slow um, and go for um, animals that um, help to um, produce quickly and can, can generate some income. Pigs, of course, reproduce quickly and they grow out in for us, it's about eight to nine months to, to get to market weight. Uh, that's because of, of the longer term natural process. So um, that's advice I give on the, on the financial side is to, to not um, overcommit, try not to go overly in debt uh, to try to, to make it work. That's just been a philosophy that we've had around it to try to, to build it in a slow and steady way. And it also helps to, to build the breeds. Um, advice, I do believe um, uh, uh, investment in uh, uh, infrastructure around perimeter fence, but within and inside, and I, I recall uh, Gabe Brown saying the same kind of thing. He said, uh, I wouldn't put up so much permanent fencing, and that would be to use um, temporary kinds of fencing materials or infrastructure materials that uh, can... Uh, be uh, mobile and flexible. And so that's been helpful for us to um, be able to um, create a three acre uh, paddock or a, 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 a maybe a larger area uh, paddock. Um, I do think but, uh, when you make them smaller, it means more frequent rotation and a little bit more work. But I think that that works better uh, because when they have a large, when it, grazers have a large space to work with, they cherry pick and, and pick the foods that they want, and they may not uh, go after the, the, the grazing uh, for the smaller or, or other varieties that, um, that you would want them to, to help to maybe either eradicate or, or push down. We're running okay on time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss a few more questions that have come in um, to you, Kevin. Um, do you ecologically manage your natural areas, like the savanna and woods? Like, for instance, do you do controlled burning? And then a second part to that question is, what kind of trees um, did you, if you did put them in a lot along the savanna pasture? Yes. Um, so we have not done any burning, uh, like any, uh, um, a, a, along like a field burn or something like that. We may uh, pull out some, um, uh, tree that's like a, sm a small tree sapling kind of thing that we cut down and, and put it into a pile and burn that but we don't do a, a large scale field burn uh, to turn things over uh, we're more hopeful that the um, the animals will take care of that in a uh, natural way um, what was the second question um, concerning trees in the savanna, uh, are there any that you planted? Yes, uh, a variety of oaks uh, that uh, grow well in our area. Again, these were uh, trees that we got from the uh, Soil Water Conservation uh, District here locally. So it was a variety of oaks as well as uh, some uh, pines and um, um, fir trees to mix in with that. And you, the one that I showed you actually was a small cedar type tree. And uh, we, think there's a, a good variety or there to help. And, and where we were putting the hedgerow was actually to help uh, build a, um, not only a windbreak, but also a filter because the, the field to the north of us, um, up until about two years ago, 
was a large cornfield. And so if it would be sprayed, we didn't want that drift to come over. So we thought those trees would help filter that. Uh, now it's been uh, converted to an orchard, which is great and we love that, but um, they also do some spray. So those trees will help also to help uh, act as a, as a filter and, uh, and a windbreak. Excellent. Um, final couple of questions here. Do you have any recommendations where, for where people who might be interested in you know, moving from conventional um, to regenerative practices could find support? And conversely also, um, would you consider consulting with others who want to do what you're doing? Um, I'm, I'm very willing to share whatever knowledge that I have. And I, I just would say that there are, every person that I've run into that's working in this area, every person, and I, I mean farmer, has been very willing to, to just stop what they're doing and share their story to, to help encourage others. And so, A, I am happy to do that one um, for whatever contribution I can make, but also in the community of, I'd say ecologically minded farmers, it just seems to be that's the practice is to not try to hold on to privacy or proprietary information, but to share it with everyone to help um, make the, the rising tide raise all boats. And so that's how I look at that. Uh, so I'd, I'd be happy to, to help in any way I could. Great. Do you have an on-site store open to retail customers? Our, we do uh, sell on site, um, but we do it by uh, appointment right now. Um, we hope to expand it. We may uh, have it where it would be on a regular hours basis, but that involves additional um, um, health department uh, clearances and so forth. So we do, we do sell and we have uh, kind of coordinated that through our health department, but we uh, are right now we're uh, happy to, to A, sell through subscription and delivery and two through um, uh, the, that little small farmer's market. And we do anticipate that that will happen again uh, this year. Great. And the question I've been saving for the last for you, Kevin, um, what breed of dog do you have for garden? Great, I'm glad you asked. Uh, Cause I wanted to say it's a Maremma. These are Maremmas. We do have a breeding pair of, uh, of them, a male and a female. And then we, uh, we have a, a mixed breed Anatolian uh, mix that uh, supports us as well. But the Maremmas we're very, very happy with. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Kevin, for being with us this morning. That was fantastic. Um, and as we transition to our final speaker for the morning, um, I just wanna do another quick shout out to our sponsors, the Natural Land Institute and the Illinois Division of the Isaac Walton League. Um, and now to introduce our final, our final speaker for the morning, um, the Biomass Crop Pr Production and Physiology Lab led by Dr. Emily Heaton aims to understand the growth and productivity of dedicated biomass crops in the Midwest and how they can be managed to provide multiple ecosystem services. Um, we, spe we specifically seek to elucidate the reciprocal impact of environment on key physiological processes like photosynthesis, biomass accumulation, water use, and nutrient cycling. Typical activities focus on the plant and field plot scale with inferences at the watershed and ecosystem scale. Through collaboration, we use our data to explain observed phenomena and predict future behavior with an ultimate goal of providing useful information to policy and the public about the role of biomass crops, the role biomass crops can and should play in the Midwestern USA. And now um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Heaton and welcome her to our virtual Zoom stage. Thanks so much, Brandon. Hopefully you can see my first slide there. I should say making conservation pay, uh, which Oops. is why, oh, great, okay. So that's what I uh, decided to paraphrase my title as. And oh, and thanks so much, Laura, for showing the poll results. So I just wanted to have a look and see who's on the call today. And it looks like uh, a good mix, uh, predominated by local government and municipalities and nonprofits. So, my comments today are geared toward producers, uh, which is 10% of the audience, but I think a lot of us wear multiple hats. So for example, um, I'm gonna talk to you today from my, uh, my, the position of my new role at the University of Illinois. 
Um, but as uh, Brandon mentioned, my background is in, in biomass crop physiology. And I actually do, uh, I'll feature a little bit of my family farm. I moved back to Illinois to help um, support my, my own family farm that has a diversified uh, crop grazing um, operation. So I want to say I'm, I'm pleased to be back in Illinois. I just started at the university in January and where I'm the, a professor of regenerative agriculture in the crop sciences department and a director of the Illinois Regenerative Agriculture Initiative, which is a new program aimed to uh, support regenerative ag. I'm still an affiliate professor at Iowa State University, uh, where I was for the last 12 years. So you'll see uh, a lot of Iowa and Illinois um, points in this conversation. Make the conversation go. Okay, so this presentation today is about how you make conservation pay on your operation. Um, and that, that, by definition, is very personal. And I'm going to share uh, the stories of, of people that are close to me who are trying to make this happen. So in this picture, um, I'm showing you uh, Elsie Borsma on the left with her dad, Nick Borsma, who got his PhD with me, uh, as they're putting a new crop, a new biomass crop, miscanthus, on a field and comparing it to corn soy. So you'll see stories like that throughout. But the way I'm approaching this presentation today is to, um, to think through some of the decision making that we heard really nicely from David and Kevin. Um, you heard different ways to think about profit, and we'll talk about that. We didn't talk too much about what your inference base is, but what are your land and what are your crop choices? What decisions do you have control over and what don't you? Um, and what do you want out of, out of those land and crop choices? And then, as you heard from, um, from both David and Kevin, uh, I'll emphasize thinking about return on investment. Uh, I'll try to do that from individual practices, but really it's just a, a switch in mindset for a lot of commercial farmers to think from return on investment uh, compared to improving or increasing revenue or increasing yield. And then if time allows, and I think it does, I'd like to tell you a little bit about biomass crops because those are crops that um, all the data I see points us towards, particularly in a, a carbon-centric economy, uh, which we seem to be moving towards, biogenic carbon economy. Okay, so before I dig in, I would like to give you a list of some resources that I find really helpful. And so two of these, uh, half of these are from Iowa, half of these are from Illinois, but really they both, all these resources span uh, the Midwest region. So if you're looking for people who you can bounce ideas off of, we had lots of conversation, you know, about how do you, how do you get hairpins out of your rows, things like that. Um, if you want to, if you want to exchange ideas on equipment or breeds or varieties, uh, I find the Idea Farm Network really helpful. And this is um, just a Google group of about three to 400 farmers across the Midwest and other people uh, like me who um, exchange ideas. So it basically comes as an email and you can email certain people or you can see what the group is talking about. And you sign up through that or sign up for that through uh, Regenerate Illinois at that website there. Um, I have also joined the Practical Farmers of Iowa. This is a farmer-led organization that's grown exponentially since it was started in the 1980s, now covers, I think, uh, eight states. And I find that there's excellent peer-to-peer -peer support within Practical Farmers of Iowa with a very active research community as well. So you'll have university scientists working alongside, alongside farmers, who are, and it's the farmers that are conducting the work that they want to see done on their own fields and they have great meetings, great storytelling, great potlucks. It's a, it's a nice organization. The, the types of financial analysis I've done for this presentation or will show you um, come from places like the next two sources. So FarmDoc is a University of Illinois uh, resource that gives you farm analysis solution tools. So these are our templates, usually in Microsoft um, uh, software. Uh, programs that will help you calculate the return on investment from new practices on your farm. So that'd be crops, livestock, there's stuff at the whole farm level, there's stuff at the crop level. Uh, similarly, the Ag Decision Maker at Iowa State has um, similar type things, but they are different. So for example, in the Ag Decision Maker, um, I found a lot more about, you know, you could do cost and returns from different vegetables. Um, there's templates for how to talk to your landowner. There's templates for how to talk to your tenant. 
uh, talk to the bank <laughs> what, what data or, um, or information you should take to, to different people if you're trying to get them to think about adopting some of these practices or you want to see if, if it will pay. So there's a variety of tools. Those are um, all great places to explore. And I can direct you to people to help you think that through if, if you're of interest. Okay, so now I'd like to move uh, to, to the idea of profit. So profit is, is a, its um, most simple equation, revenue minus cost or sales minus cost. Uh, but there's lots of different ways to, to think about what you value. So are these just financial sales or financial uh, returns and financial costs, or is there more involved for you? And to illustrate this, I have a picture here of um, one of my postdocs, um, Elka Brandes, and I'll show you some of her work later in the presentation. Um, she and her husband own an olive farm in Italy, and they have two kids in this picture. And she did some analysis comparing trade-offs between biomass production, financial returns on an on a area of land, and water quality. So, and she was thinking about it in terms of how she raises her family and how she manages their land. So it, there's lots of different ways to think about what's of value to you, but I think we all are in agreement that if a farm is not financially solvent, it doesn't matter what kind of sustainability practices you want to do. You won't be economically sustainable and therefore you won't own that land uh, to be able to do those things. So we have to be financially solvent before we can do um, other things. So again, it's sticking with the theme of storytelling, which um, I was asked to do for this, this presentation. I'm not going to read you these words, but here's um, an example from uh, Mark and Melanie Peterson, who have 500 acres in Stanton, Iowa, and are involved in Practical Farmers of Iowa for many years, just with some of the same numbers that you've been hearing from Dave and Kevin. So for example, um, uh, Mark writes here that he's in, in, in 10 years of, of cover cropping, he's seen an increase of 1% in organic matter, which equates in his calculations for his farm to about 20 pounds of nitrogen, and an extra inch of water holding capacity. And he goes on to say that in the times when we have so much uncertainty, uh, both in terms of weather and markets, that uh, this increased buffering capacity that organic matter gives him on his farm has been very helpful. But he emphasizes at the end here that the thing that is most in is usually in most farmers control is, is cutting down on costs. You don't usually get to set your price, so you get to control your costs, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about next. Okay, so this is a figure, as this is a table actually, from um, one of those farm doc uh, um, tools that I referenced earlier. This is showing the corn revenues and costs of Northern Illinois um, from 2014 through 2019 with projections for 2020 and 2021. And I read a few questions here. So as you think about how you make conservation pay on your operation or you're trying to incentivize it on other people's operation, think about over what do those people have control? What do you have control? Um, and then, you know, do you have the numbers that you need to have to make decisions? So for example, do you know the re your return on investment? Maybe you know it at a whole farm scale. Do you know it at a field scale? So we saw some lovely um, profit maps from Dave's grandson using Ag Leader software. Um, and so I'll, I'll come to, to points like that in a little bit, but making sure you have the types of numbers that you need uh, to make the decisions that you want to make. Uh, and then you know, if, if you're in a tenant agreement or a landowner agreement that you feel you have some restrictions, you know, do you have the freedom to try new things on your land? Um, can you try it on a few acres? Can you try it in side-by-side -side strips? Um, and then lastly here, do you have access to animals and or manure? You know, both presentations that we just heard incorporated animals. And that's been a time-honored strategy in farming is to have crop livestock operations to diversify the operation and make sure that you always have a place to get rid of your crop and a place to get rid of your manure. A lot of people are not in that situation anymore, and they don't have access to the human capital that you need for, um, for animal operations. I think there are those of us who would argue that um, that means that we need more job creation in agriculture, and incorporating plant animal agriculture again will stimulate job growth, as we saw from uh, the previous two speakers having multiple generations on the farm. So I just want to walk through. Uh, in this table, you know how, how I think about this. 
so first of all, you know, do I have much control over the yield per acre? Well, I sure hope so. Um, I do what I can to improve yields, but honestly, I'm, I'm often trying to keep yields stable. Um, that seems to be as just a big of a um, challenge with changing climate as, as increasing yields. But we heard a nice commentary from David in particular about, you know, try varieties that work for your field. Um, don't necessarily trust the salesperson. Uh, try to get a diversity of information. Uh, and different co-ops often do variety trials. Uh, so you don't really have a lot of control over prices. So I'm moving on um, to other ways that you might control the revenue side of things. Um, so this has other government payments as a line here. 2020 and um, saw some pretty big um, pay direct payments to farmers through um, trade bills. So nothing that we would normally think that we have control over on our farm, but really affected farm income in the past couple of years. Where we do typically have more control every year is in the input side of things. And you've heard a lot about this, so I won't, I won't um, uh, continue to go over it in full detail, but just remember uh, you have influence over where you get the inputs that your crop needs or deciding whether or not your crop needs those inputs. Maybe diversifying your operation will reduce the need for some of these inputs. Uh, one thing I did want to spend a little bit more time on compared to the other speakers is this idea of machinery. Uh, so it, we, we, again, we saw numbers on this from Dave, so I appreciate it. This is looking at um, all machinery calculations put together uh, into a per acre number that's listed here as total power cost. The reason I wanted to talk a little about machinery is because um, on Christmas Eve, across the field from my house, a farmer was doing some tillage after dark on Christmas Eve. So I'd say it was about eight o'clock, filled the whole field. And one has to wonder why, <laughs> why in a drought year uh, are you out tilling soybean stubble on Christmas Eve? Is that, is that paying for you economically? And so I just have to wonder, you know, we can talk about economics all we want, but there are a lot of reasons that people do things that they do. And particularly if the tractor's already paid for and the implement's already paid for, recreational tillage is uh, a time-honored pastime in the uh, Midwest US, especially if you don't feel like being stuck in the house with your family on Christmas Eve. So I would you know, encourage people who are interested in recreational tillage to think about it uh, like this. So this is the custom rate estimate per operation on a per acre basis. Um, that this one's from Iowa State University, but you can get these from Minnesota or from um, Illinois as well. And this helps you put a, a monetary cost on those tillage operations. So if, if you know someone who's tilling more than you think maybe they need to, ask them if they'd like to make another, you know, in this case, if we look at, um, you know, this, this farmer across from me was um, disc chiseling. So, you know, about $20 an acre, would they rather do that? Uh, would they, you know, rather increase their profit by $20 right away? Or well, maybe just don't go through the field on Christmas Eve or any time between planting and harvest or harvest and planting. Another um, farmer I'd like to feature is uh, my colleague, Rob Stout. So Rob Stout is a, a farmer in Eastern Iowa and he's got about, uh, says here, at least when the story was written, he had 9,000 pigs, farms about 1,100 acres. He also employs his son on the farm um, was able to bring him on in the drought year of 2012, so that's impressive. Um, and Rob's been on farmer advisory boards with me for many years, and I've really admired the way he tries new practices. So Rob has a, um, an animal and crop operation, so he can do different things than maybe some other people do. But when he started, he was one of the only people in his area who did new things like cover crops. And now his county has the highest rate of adoption of conservation or regenerative ag practices in the state of Iowa. And it's largely attributable to Rob telling his story. And like Kevin and David said, being willing to show anyone who wanted to come out what he was doing. He writes for Wallace's Farmer. He, um, he's got a high energy level and is always willing to share. And here he shares, you know, for example, he, he estimates he's saving 30 to $40,000 every year in fertilizer costs from manure. He also gets a lot of those same benefits from cover crops that we uh, have already heard about. So for those who are thinking about trying something new, how to get started or how to talk about it with the bank. Um, so I mentioned some, some resources. Here's just one that I'm featuring because this is one that, that I've used. 
dry farm, but when you're trying to figure out if you should switch from crops to livestock or incorporate livestock or switch from different crops, do you want to do hay and on some of those corn soybean fields, maybe incorporate um, uh, O alfalfa rotation into your corn soy, uh, which is something that's increasingly popular. Uh, here's just some of the worksheet type things that you can do. I'm just showing you page one. This is like a six tab worksheet. So it's a full decision making tool for you that can also be really helpful if you're doing intergenerational things on your operation. Uh, I don't know how it works for, for some of those on this call, but understanding what my dad has been doing for the last 20 years as my sister and I now and make more decisions on the farm is really challenging. But if we can get him to let us fill out a form like this, it provides a way for us to have record keeping and decision making space as we think about doing something different when he may not always give us uh, an objective answer for why he's doing the practice that he's doing. So these are super useful tools. Again, there's ones for, um, for I think, 15 different types of vegetable crops. Uh, there's biomass crops like switchgrass and miscanthus that I'm going to tell you about uh, a little bit next. But another way to think about um, your profit is your time. Depending again on whether you own your land, whether you're a full-time operator or part-time operator, um, for most people, time is money. Uh, this is a picture of a field that I uh, took on and established, um, miscanthus, a, a perennial biomass grass, on in this pothole. So a pothole is a, an ephemerally flooded area. The upper Midwest is called the prairie pothole region. We have these spots and fields that, that just don't drain as well. Um, in, in Illinois and um, most of the upper Midwest, we have heavily tiled fields so that we uh, don't have this ephemeral flooding within fields, but it's come back with increasingly heavy rainfall events uh, thanks to, to climate change. So I'm going to show you what we did to this pothole to try to increase the frequency with which we could access this field. So we had trouble that we, we couldn't get on this field when we wanted to, and we couldn't especially for custom operations, we couldn't get the co-op co to come out and spray for us or do custom operations for us because they couldn't cover the whole field, so they weren't going to come. And this is, you know, a problem for everyone. So here's the figure on the left showing the number of suitable days in the spring uh, for field work. Uh, so this is April 2nd to June 17th. On the y-axis is the number of days during that period that are typically suitable uh, for field work, and that x-axis goes from 19, uh, let's see, 64 through 2018. And during that period, we've essentially lost about 14 working days each spring for field operations. Um, and we have a, a slightly uh, less dramatic story in the fall, but notice the variability around our number of working days. Um, what, what did David say? We don't, they don't pay the weatherman enough? Uh, so that's, that's increasingly common throughout the Midwest, but you never know when you're going to get out in the field. So conventional wisdom from land-grant universities was buy bigger equipment, cover more land and more time, uh, so you can do a thousand acres in three days, uh, do all your tillage operations, just, just do them faster. Um, but increasingly, you know, that just doesn't work, and people don't necessarily want to spend that kind of money. So what does work, although it's maybe not as um, you know, sexy in terms of big steel on, on your shed is to have smaller equipment that can get on the field. Uh, it's lighter, so it can get on the field when the things are a little bit wetter and just have some, can, some living cover on your field that improves infiltration. We've talked a lot about cover crops. This is a figure from a, a nice paper um, from Andrea Bash and Marcia DeLong a few years ago, reviewing infiltration rates between different land covers. And what hopefully you can take away from this picture is that as you add um, diversity to the farm operation, whether it's adding crops and livestock or no-till cover crops, diversified crop rotations, and, and then even perennial plants, you get more happening in your soil. You get things penetrating deeper in the soil, roots and microbes and creatures that make holes. And so the water moves through faster and more of it. Uh, here's um, the results that they found survey, surveying a huge body of, of peer-reviewed literature. What you're seeing here on the y-axis is the, the type of practice ranging from no-till uh, down through crops and livestock. 
And then the percent change in infiltration rate that was observed with the conservation practice. So this is just how fast is the water draining through that field. Uh, so a higher number means the water is draining faster, so higher is better. And so the, the highest rates of infiltration that they observed uh, surveying the literature was with incorporation of perennial crops, long-lived, deep-rooted perennials. We've talked a lot today about crops and livestock. Um, in this case, the, that reduced infiltration, but that's likely an artifact of the way that the studies were done. You can't just uh, measure infiltration in small paddocks around the water, the water tank. Um, overall, crops and livestock integration, particularly of pastures, do have improved infiltration rates. Just you can't measure right under the animal. So I want to go back to that, that pothole I showed you and talk a little bit about um, our work with biomass crops. So this is a picture of me in, in July 2019. Um, I know driving through northern Illinois in the spring of 2019, it was every bit of the hot mess that Iowa was uh, and the amount of prevent plant acres because of flooding was, was astronomical. Uh, so here's the place where the, what I'm standing in, the weed patch I'm standing in was corn um, at the edge of a pothole. The center of the pothole behind me is still completely inundated. And you can see hopefully a range of different crop species around me. The one directly behind me is Miscanthus gigantea, the biomass crop that I've worked on for several years um, that I've recently started looking at for uh, incorporation into these ephemeral potholes, these ephemeral wetlands. You also see biomass sorghum back on the left. Um, that's one of the ones that was in Dave's carbon mix. He had looked like some sorghum sedan grass and some grain sorghum. So these crops are kind of like a menu. You can mix and match these sometimes in the same field, but sometimes as a patchwork uh, within your field. And we'll come to how that pays off in profit in a minute. So one thing to take away here is that perennials can increase access. If you'll remember, uh, I think it's Mexico City was um, a, a, a city that was actually built on a lake bed. So it's causing problems now, right? Mexico City is not ge geologically stable because it's built on a lake bed, but native people use grasses and silt and sediment to fill in the lake so they could build on it. And that's essentially what we're doing uh, in some of um, these ephemeral wetlands and crop fields is just put roots in the ground so you can drive on it <laughs> if you can't farm it. So that's what we did with this Miscanthus. And Miscanthus has a really deep, um, strong rhizome system where the, the rhizomes interlock and they're almost like putting living rebar in the soil. It really stabilizes it. Um, but Miscanthus is, just one of many crops that we could think about doing this with. One thing I'd like you to take away from this picture is that the miscanthus is still growing when the rest of the crop, the grain crops have senesced. And when we think about biomass crops, you know, ones that we might use for energy or bedding or building materials um, that maybe don't need to dry down the same way our grain crops do, we having a crop that, that grows longer during the growing season just means that it can capture more, more solar energy and convert that solar energy into stable biomass energy. So Miscanthus is one of those crops that stays green longer and really is good at, at storing solar energy as, as a green battery. Um, and here's just a picture of some of the, the types of residue that we're working with with Miscanthus, uh, and this is similar for switchgrass. Um, you really create a, a very drivable work surface very quickly. Uh, and this is you know following along from what uh, you heard about, about um, soil tilth and field suitability from, from David's talk in particular. Okay, so how do we think about, you know, you've heard a lot about multi-species mixtures. You've now heard from me about perennial biomass crops in certain parts of fields. How do you think about putting these pieces of information together and how much does it matter at, you know, across the United States? Are, are we talking about niche stuff here? Or is this stuff that's, that's meaningful for a large swath of the population? Uh, so here's an analysis from a company called AgSolver um, that's since been turned into to other companies. But AgSolver really helped change the way um, people were thinking about return on investment within their fields. And so here's an aggregate analysis that they did with the United, uh, United States uh, Department of Agriculture, looking at um, 4,000 fields uh, across the United States, over 200,000 acres, um, and finding that within um, Within these fields, there was a huge range of uh, profit and an overall return on investment of 0.46% there at the bottom. 
Now, I don't know if you look at your investment portfolios or you uh, think about investing, but you know, venture capital expects a rate of return, a return on investment about 20%. Uh, most people consider three to 5% as a good, a good rate of return. Uh, so 0.46% is not considered a good rate of return, a return on investment for most people. So why is that? Why is farmland being held to a lower investment uh, uh, threshold than other investments? Well, here's a zoomed in look at a field. So this is mapping uh, return on investment, similar to what you saw from, from David's uh, SMS yield monitor. And in this case, we see that there's a, a part of the field, the left-hand portion, this, this sandy ridge, it happens to be in this case, that consistently gets um, a negative return on investment. And in fact, in this overall analysis of nearly 200,000 acres, uh, nearly 4,000 fields, about 90% of the fields had zones like this, where year over year, there was an economic loss. Um, and then about half of those were not only uh, an economic liability, but also an environmental liability. So if you think about, in this case, this is a sandy ridge. Um, sand doesn't hold water very well. And if you're putting on a lot of nitrates, nitrogen, and it rains, and you get nitrates moving quickly through sandy soils, and you can find distributions like this. So now I'm showing you an analysis that Elka Brandis, that I showed you at the beginning, did for Iowa, where she, uh, mapped out at a, at a subfield scale, so in this case, a nine by nine meter resolution within fields, where we thought places, where we thought corn and soybean was losing money and where we thought it was leaching nitrogen. And so what I'm showing you in this, um, this graph here was got nitrate leaching on the y-axis up to 200 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, which is roughly equivalent to pounds per acre. And on the um, x-axis is profitability in dollars per hectare per year. And you know, I can help you translate between um, hectares and acres, but this, this line here up the middle is roughly $100. And um, negative is bad, no matter what units you're in. So this red area, the reddest spot here, shows the number of, of nine by nine uh, area parts of the field that we're losing a lot of nitrogen and losing a lot of money. So those are the places where we have an opportunity to do something different without any increases in costs, just quit losing money. Um, and so what we talked about doing here in this case was putting um, switchgrass on those unprofitable parts of fields. And in Iowa, we found in, in a watershed of interest, um, so there's a watershed that, that gives water to the city of Des Moines. Uh, and the city of Des Moines drinking water was so high in nitrate, they were actually suing the counties upstream as point source polluters under the Clean Water Act. So we found that if those counties that were being sued would just put perennial grasses in or perennial plants on the parts of corn and soybean fields that were losing more than $100 per hectare anyway, it would be enough to meet our water quality goals that the state had. Um, to improve the drinking water. So we're not talking about rocket science stuff here. <laughs> we're talking about kind of approaching this from a do no harm perspective, but there's some really low hanging fruit opportunities um, to put perennial plants on places that are already economic and environmental liabilities and improve outcomes uh, for both economies and uh, environment. So for the municipality people on the call here, this has really come home um, to play when we think about what we put around water treatment plant facilities. And in Iowa, we're already starting to see municipalities paying farmers upstream of the leach fields to adopt uh, diversified farming practices. So there's direct payments to farmers from municipalities. So municipalities don't have to increase nitrate removal facilities. So what I'm talking about here and what you've heard about from, from Dave and Kevin and I today is not necessarily easy. It takes some um, more management per acre sometimes. I think you already heard about that. Again, job creation. You need people who know how to think about farm landscapes and know how to think about how you manage the crops for, for the desired outcomes. And there are increasingly places to get help. So Pheasants Forever is one that's doing this for people for free. So they are, you can call Pheasants Forever 
Um, there's actually not currently people in uh, Northern Illinois region, but I know you can call and someone will come help you because I've already done it. Um, but they will work with you to understand your goals, your operations goals. And then if you look at this flow chart here, it says understand goals, um, connect to data. So, so David had um, SMS um, basic data. They can work with that like Ag Leader. They can work with Field View that you get from um, Bayer or Climate Core, uh, from um, TrueTerra, that lots of different commercially available land management software packages. They will, they will look at the data however you have it, help you analyze your operations, and they know um, they, they are more up to date with the farm programs in your area than most people I've met. So they will help you find money for farm practices that match your goals and they don't charge anything for it. This is currently being funded by grants for them. And so they're employing several people. Um, this is Josh Bendorf, who's gonna graduate from my lab um, in the next month. And he's already started as a precision conservation specialist in Southwest Iowa. I mean, he's, he's here to work through your operations for you and, and help you find the solution that works for you. Your co-op might increasingly be able to help you. Your co-op already has agronomists to sell you products. Now they're thinking about agronomists to sell you uh, technical expertise and know-how, particularly in terms of diversifying operations. Happens to be another student from my lab, Ruth McCabe, um, who is working with Heartland Co-op that has over 70 locations in the upper Midwest and Texas. And through grants with the Iowa Soybean Association and others, she's, she's paid to come out and help you figure out uh, what you could do differently to increase your bottom line and improve, in, in this case, soil health. Things that are gonna basically get you ready for, for carbon market system. Okay, so now I just wanna take a moment um, to ask Brandon if I'm doing okay on time. Sorry to put Brandon on the spot here. Yes, you are, we're about 10 after the hour. Um, and so I think if we have, you know, some time for questions at the end, that's great. Um, so yeah, I think we're fine. Okay, then I will try to get back on the right screen. And the next thing I'd like to, I'd just like to spend a little bit of time talking to you about um, perennial biomass crops in particular, because I think you're gonna hear more about them as, um, you know, we have a $2 trillion recovery plan uh, being pushed through Congress right now and a climate plan that's likely to come after that. And I think you're going to hear more and more about ecosystem service farming. And you can talk about making tweaks to corn and soybean operations that improve carbon. But if you really want to take carbon out of the air and put it someplace safe below ground, uh, perennial plants do that better than almost anything else. And these perennial plants oftentimes are going to be used um, for products that currently we get from fossil fuel products. So I'll tell you more about that in just a second. But first I wanna show you the answer to this question, can perennial biomass be more profitable than corn and soy? Because when I was getting my degree um, in crop sciences 20 years ago, I thought perennial plants were great for lots of things, but money wasn't one of them. <laughs> That's the farm environment that I grew up in um, and why I, I left the farm. And my dog might start barking shortly. Give me one second. Um, so I did an analysis to figure out whether or not there are just environmental benefits or if we could get real economic benefits from corn and soy. And so this is analysis, again, that we did with Elka building on that water quality work that I showed you before. But we said if we put switchgrass in on those places that were unprofitable in farm fields, we know we get improvements in water quality, but how much, how much more money can it make people? Um, can it make more money than corn and soy? And so what I'm showing you in this map, this is a map um, done by townships and we did it by townships because that's a tax base, um, that's, a, that's a small scale of tax bases for, for municipalities to think about. And overall, corn and soy makes more money than um, switchgrass over most of Iowa. That shouldn't be a shocker with current market and you know, with the way Iowa is set up. But there are places, particularly places that have some of the highly erodible land, the, um, the environmental susceptibility, um, that where switchgrass makes more money. And in some cases, so what we found on average was it was $130 million more in the long run on a 10-year horizon than, than corn 
uh, corn and soy made over the whole state. And in some places, some of these counties, we're talking about a $40 million difference in county level tax receipts because of adoption of switchgrass just on the places where corn and soy wasn't pulling its weight. So, you know, if you're thinking about local hospitals, you know, school busing, <laughs> these are the kind of levels and in, in increasing in taxable income for rural communities that are meaningful. And when we did this analysis, um, we used some really conservative estimates for how much someone could get for a ton of switchgrass. And the price of switchgrass to farmers, the payment to farmers is going up. And here's part of the reason why. This is um, a figure from Amazon that I screenshot I took this morning of um, um, earthable fibers. So I, I heard earlier, I think David had worked with Milan, Tennessee. So this is a company, Genera Bioenergy uh, is based in Milan, Tennessee. And they invested in pulp manufacturing equipment several years ago, thinking bioenergy wasn't really moving forward because it's not. But um, people use a lot of disposable products. And so I actually bought these plates off Amazon uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we have this for cookouts at my house in the future. And these happen to be made 100% out of miscanthus right now, um, but they'll be made out of switchgrass and sorghum and other US grown fibers. And so this is just a little bit more about earthables and it, what I'm showing you here with these, um, these icons are that a lot of the things that are given points in ecosystem service markets. So they have an, uh, you can do a life cycle assessment on them. They are, um, are field to grave compatible. They're compostable, for example. Uh, and then importantly, a lot of places are, are banning uh, styrofoam. So the state of Maryland, for example, just banned styrofoam last fall. Well, during COVID, there's been a huge increase in takeout. So you have abandoned styrofoam and a huge increase in takeout, and all of a sudden the markets for compostable fibers and takeout packages have really increased. So right now, um, the, the price of biomass is going up. Um, and so one way to think about this that I find particularly exciting is that, uh, I mean, I've talked a lot about Iowa. Iowa is the nation's leading um, turkey and egg producer. So imagine if not just only if we didn't uh, only grow the eggs in Iowa, but what if we also grew the cartons? And there's no reason why we shouldn't. And so I'm just going to finish up here by showing you the stories of a few miscanthus farmers um, from Iowa and Illinois. This is one, this is a picture from Eric Rund, who farms um, just south of me in Tolono, Illinois. And he's grown miscanthus for several years now. So that's a picture of miscanthus there on the bottom left. And he estimates that um, uh, cost him well, he sells it for ninety dollars uh, a ton right now, and on an equivalent energy basis, that equates to um, three hundred dollars in uh, liquid propane. And of course, if anyone's filled their tank lately, at least around here, that three hundred dollars was eight hundred dollars last month. So um, he has a huge energy savings on uh, using miscanthus for for energy applications, and then also for Turkey bedding. So it says right at the top there, turkey bedding is our best market today. Poultry bedding is increasingly popular, uh, or miscanthus is increasingly popular as a poultry bedding. And so there's, there's rapid expansion of miscanthus markets along the eastern seaboard where there's um, intense poultry production, but also in the Midwest. And here's a little bit of Eric's, um, there's Eric there, it's a little bit of his farm uh, economics. And I'm showing you here his, his numbers from 2020. And so there's corn there on the left. He netted at the bottom there $284 per acre from his corn. He netted 332 on his soybeans. And only 129 this year on his miscanthus. And this is in part because he didn't get government payments for his miscanthus acres this year, um, but also because we're working through some things on his miscanthus yield and his harvest technology. It's a new crop. But going back to that quote, um, Meta earlier in the presentation about, about just crop resiliency and, and sustainability of yields. Here's the long-term economic comparison that Eric has from his corn and soy uh, to his miscanthus. Miscanthus is the green line. So the green line is lower, but it's really steady. And we have no reason to expect that green line to go down. So you plant miscanthus once, and then the, the, we expect the right now the, the harvested lifespan um, is 20 years at least. So 
you know, amortize your crop returns over a 20 year period and they start to look better and better each year. Um, so this is the kind of data that we now have available to take to bankers who previously didn't know anything about miscanthus or some of these energy crops. But this is the kind of um, stability in, in returns that may not be attractive to everybody, but is certainly attractive to some, especially when coupled with ecosystem service benefits. And then I'll just finish up showing you Steve Schomburg. Uh, he is a fifth generation farmer in Eastern Iowa near Iowa City. And here he's showing you how he um, incorporated miscanthus into other areas of his farm that he just didn't want to mess with or that he knew had um, some challenges. So he had some weirdly shaped places. He had some less productive places. Um, so it says less productive, more erodible, more slope, odd shape. And some places he just needed to drive through to get to other places. Um, so he's incorporated that. He started in 2013. He has in increased his plantings every year and he is now selling um, working with a company in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on erosion control pro products. So um, the, the municipality has sponsored a local business. Uh, it's now employs something like 30 people that make these erosion control products. Uh, and all the, all the money stays in the local area as well as you know, all the carbon and all the nitrogen stays on the field. So I'd just like to finish by um, you know, saying diversifying, strategically diversifying your cropland using some economic metrics um, can result in a host of co-benefits that are increasingly also profitable in, a general, in addition to having, having value. And what I didn't show on this figure is the people. Um, you know, we've talked about multiple generations on the farm. Uh, I now am a second generation on the farm. My, um, my son and my nephews are the third generation. And uh, these kids all, they're all healthy. <laughs> None of them have, um, you know, they're all healthy weights. They all um, have healthy um, performance. There's a lot to be said for raising children on, on grass and animals um, raised in, in these types of manners. So takeaway points, this is a figure just showing um, that there are benefits, uh, both ecological um, and environmental and agronomic from diversifying farmland. Some of those benefits are to the, the landowner, they're private. And some of them are to the public, they're external. And you have to think about the whole system uh, when you're thinking about what to tweak for making conservation pay. You can't just think at a field level, although you need to have the numbers at a field level. And also, of course, you know, what, what's within your control? I, I encourage people to focus on value, what they want from their operation, uh, making sure they're economically solvent, but recognizing the value they get from things beyond uh, yield or sales. And, the future policy uh, and markets are likely to increasingly favor perennials as, as a source of ecosystem services. Diversifying farms uh, in terms of both plants, animals, and, and people, diversifying them in terms of the people who work them, usually increases um, outcomes of, of importance. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Here's the website to the, the new regenerative ag initiative that we have at the University of Illinois. Um, sorry, this picture encompassed a lot of things for me. It's got Iowa State on my hat, Illinois on my heart. And then you can see our family farm, my parents wandering around in the background as they look at the gardens and the sheep in the background. We also have Marama dogs and Great Pyrenees for our, our sheep. And we, um, we raise uh, Katahdin sheep and uh, bourbon red turkeys as well as cattle. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions that you have. Thanks so much for your attention. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to some questions, um, I do want to draw people's attention to the chat where, where Laura has dropped um, a survey um, for, today's, for today's event. Um, so please do, you know, if you have to get going, be sure to, to um, help us out and take that survey. Um, as we as we move toward the end of today's session. Um, so we had some questions. A few that came up initially were about miscanthus um, and some concern that it can be an invasive species, especially if there are natural areas in the vicinity. Um, and then a follow-up to that about whether there's there are other um, native grass species that could be used besides miscanthus for this type of, of product. Yes, sure. Um... Just a brief word on miscanthus invasive potential. I'm only talking here about miscanthus giganteus. 
it's now been studied for 50 years. So um, my work uh, has gone for 20 years and we have shown decreased risk of invasion from Miscanthus gigantes compared to almost any other crop species or, or almost any other species. In fact, it's one of the only plants that consistently passes the Australian weed risk assessment test. Um, most of our crop plants don't pass that test. That said, Miscanthus isn't what the thing is, isn't right for you. Um, I, it broke my heart, but I kept out of today's talk the work on the Prairie Strips project. Um, so prairiestrips.org is a place to go to uh, for information about how you might incorporate native plants into all the types of applications that I talked about today. Um, and we, we have a host of work on prairie with uh, incorporating it as a, as a biogas uh, feedstock or making, making energy, as well as doing all the purposes that I talked about today. So if you want to use native plants for sure, uh, and just and Pheasants Forever can help you with that too. A lot of the same people I talked about today can help you think about prairie if, if that's not an, if Miscanthus or switchgrass have not of interest to you. Excellent. Thinking, you know, more also another question about conservation concerns. When is switchgrass harvested? If switchgrass continues growing across the landscape, how can you how can we avoid creating sinks for grassland birds that might be attracted to these fields? Grassland birds are in sharp decline due to agriculture expansion, but how can we reclaim some of these acres back to habitat in a sustainable way for wildlife? I think the short answer to that is diversifying the landscape. So patchwork mosaics of landscapes that have crops harvested at different times of the year and different types of functional groups, prairie, row crops, trees, uh, create the, the broadest array of um, landscapes for, for birds. Having borders around fields, so that's one of the places we've really started using prairie in particular as a border around field, basically where we currently have endros. Um, instead of turning on the field, we put prairie around it and just turn on the prairie. Those endros always have reduced performance anyway because of traffic. Um, so why, why bother? Just turn on the prairie. <laughs> and then you, you don't disturb the prairie or whatever grass you choose um, so much that birds can't nest in it. So there are ways to incorporate it, but patchwork mosaic. And we had a comment, um, which I'll sort of form as a question for you. Um, farmers get pushback from farm supply companies. Um, do you have any sort of reaction to sort of that general observation? Farm supply companies listen to their customers. Um, so yeah, I totally agree they get pushback. And uh, part of the reason I moved back to a, a small town uh, was so that I could work alongside, you know, my friends and colleagues who work for these companies. And you know, we, you just gotta have the conversations with them. Um, they're there to sell stuff and they will sell the stuff that you say that you're gonna buy. So if you, if you need diverse seed mixtures or you need agronomic expertise that's not telling you just to put on more nitrogen but instead tells you how to, uh, you know, close a furrow properly or how to use a roller property properly, they will provide you with that expertise. And I think the fact that the students I mentioned um, have been hired right away by co-ops and by groups like Pheasants Forever really illustrates that that demand for, for expertise is increasing. Uh, so just encourage, encourage your farm suppliers to get you, get you what you need. And I think that's a great piece of advice um, to end on today. I want to thank Dr. Emily Heaton um, for being with us this morning. Also, Kevin Kelly and David Brandt um, for sharing your knowledge and sharing your experiences. And I love how, how you know, layered in with each of our presenters today was that sort of those themes of, of generations, those themes of family, those themes of sort of a deep connection to land um, and thinking about what's best for land in, in our Midwest region. So thank you all so much for being with us this morning. And thank you also, I'm going to put up our sponsor slide once more. Thank you also um, on behalf of the Northeastern Illinois so Soil and Water Conservation Districts, on behalf of Chicago Wilderness, on behalf of the University of Illinois Extension. Thank you to our sponsors who made this webinar today possible, um, the Natural Lands Institute and the Illinois Division of the Isaac Walton League. Thank you so much um, for making this possible today. And I just want to give a quick 
plug for some upcoming events um, from our organizations. Um, you'll see there the Warner Film Festival is ongoing um, and we have a special session on March 13th um, at 11 a.m. Um, a screening of Kiss the Ground. Um, you see that Chicago Wilderness is hosting a series of live Zoom talks um, cafes that they've been doing since all, it, coming up on a year since since this pandemic era began. Um, that's a great series of learnings. Um, there's a pollina pollinator webinar, sorry, a pollinator habitat webinar coming up there on March 19th. Um, and then an annual spring pond seminar. You can see the information, you can see the information there too. Um, and I'll leave this slide up as we close out the event today so that people can do a quick screen grab um, of all these great events that are coming up. Again, thank you to all of our presenters this morning. Thank you to everyone who attended and thank you for all the amazing questions today. And please do not forget to go ahead in that link in the chat um, to go ahead and give us some feedback in that feedback form. Um, thank you all for being here and have a great day.